the uh, meeting here. Uh, welcome to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. Uh, my name is Chris, and uh, tonight we're very pleased to uh, celebrate the launch of Be Brief and Tell Them Everything by Brad Listy. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Chelsea Hodson. And uh, if you haven't already, you can buy copies of the book at powerhousebookstores.com, and I'll share the link in the chat. And if you have any questions, uh, also just use the chat function and our speakers will take your questions and I'll quickly introduce them now. Uh, Chelsea Hodson is the author of the book of essays, Tonight I'm Someone Else. Uh, her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Freeze, Hazlitt and elsewhere. And she lives in Sedona, Arizona. Brad Listy is the author of the novel, Attention Deficit Disorder, an LA Times bestseller and Bored, a work of nonfiction collage with Justin Benton. He is the founding editor of The Nervous Breakdown, and in 2011, he launched The Other People Podcast, which features in-depth interviews with today's leading writers, and he lives in Los Angeles. Uh, I'll uh, hand it over now. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you, Powerhouse, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I see so many familiar names, and that makes me really happy and excited to be here. Um, so we are celebrating Brad Listy's book, Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. And um, I will uh, be kind of helping moderate questions later um, from the audience. So if you have a question for Brad that I'm not asking, I will ask for those um, later on in our event. So you'll, you can um, ask them through the chat later. Um, and I think because of the way this meeting is set up, I believe you can also um, maybe unmute yourself and do a video if you want to. So when we get to that, we'll see uh, what's available. <laughs> because if you can't, if you have trouble asking your own question, I will ask it for you and we can manage it through the chat. So just please know that this is, uh, this will be interactive later on. So if you have a question, uh, there'll be a time when you can ask it. But um, I'm excited to be here with Brad. I've known Brad since I think 2014 when I had a chat book come out and he was the only podcast to really take that seriously <laughs> that I that I had this tiny little book and um, I was a huge fan of Brad Listy's from his other people podcast and um, I still remember the feeling of being on his podcast for the first time I think I told him that it was like running into your teacher at the grocery store like it's like hearing the voice on my phone and me being on the show was so surreal and I just that always stuck with me because I think someone like you, Brad, is so important to the literary community of like having, you know, understanding that writers can take themselves seriously, <laughs> like be interviewed. And that's a really big thing. And now it's just great to be on the other side and interview you and celebrate your book. And um, one that I'm such a fan of. So um, I know we discussed you starting this um, by doing a short reading and then we'll kind of get into more questions. So I'll hand it over to you now, Brad. All right. Can everybody hear me? I guess everybody can, right? Yep. Okay. Well, I should say thank you to Powerhouse and thank you to Chelsea, who I think you were one of the first people to read the manuscript mm -hmm. for this I book and give me feedback. I was in like communication with you as I was like finishing it up and I didn't know what I had and you were very kind. And that's always nice when you get to the end of a manuscript and you don't know what you have. So <laughs> I owe you thanks for uh, your support and making me feel like it would be okay to possibly send this out into the world. And I appreciate everybody who showed up, everybody who's here, even though you're virtually here and silent right now. Uh, hello and thank you. And I'm going to just read a bit from the book. Uh, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. It's a novel that reads like a memoir, I'm told. It's auto fiction. It's one of these hybrid books and it's pretty close to the bone. It's definitely a personal book and a confessional book. And it is about, among other things, creation, creative exasperation, uh, failure, art, family. Uh, the narrator is named Brad Listy and he and his wife have two kids. His wife is Franny. His kids are named Oscar and Alice. And there is a struggle to have a second child. Uh, there are five miscarriages in between children, which is dealt with in the book a bit. And in the bit that I'm going to read from the, the novel now, the narrator is 
remembering the births of his children and is pondering what it means to like create a family, to create human beings on this earth at this time. So, and if you have the book at home and you prefer to follow along, I'm on page 93. When Alice was born, it went more or less according to script. 24 hours of labor, Franny opting for the epidural, the science fiction of vaginal delivery, my legs trembling wildly from adrenaline as I stood there holding her hand, the sound of Alice's cries as the doctor pulled her into the world, the obnoxious thrill of it all, the obligatory photo, the cutting of the cord, watching as she was weighed, poked, prodded, tested, everything checking out fine. They cleaned her up and swaddled her. I stood over her, stupefied. She opened her eyes and looked up at me and blinked. I again took her picture. Hi there, sweetheart. I'm your dad. The bright pink skin, the alien eyes of a newborn, glassy and baffled and blue-black. Another picture. I remember thinking to myself, she's fine and feeling terrified. On the day that Oscar was born, I had a meeting with my old writing partner, Melissa, with whom I had sold a sitcom to MTV. We had been hoping to get a pilot order, but then the network announced an executive reshuffling and abruptly informed us that it would no longer be making scripted television. Our show was now dead. Nothing else to be done about it. If we wished to continue, we would have to start over from scratch and figure out what to do next, the prospect of which seemed unappealing. I was on my way home from this meeting, feeling demoralized when Franny called with the news that her water had broken. She was at the Grove, she said, a hellish outdoor shopping mall in West Hollywood. She and Alice had gotten a Wetzel's pretzel and sat down to eat it, and when she went to get up, the breakage occurred. The official term is gross rupture, cinematic. She was mortified. A mall employee had been kind enough to bring her a blanket and she had wrapped herself in it and waddled to the parking garage, leaking everywhere. Alice, age five, peppering her with questions the entire way. A couple of hours later, Oscar was born via emergency C-section. We arrived in the maternity ward at Cedars and checked in a little breathless. And within an hour, it was done. A nerve wracking flurry of activity, some concern about the umbilical cord, the level of cervical dilation, Oscar's foot placement, commiseration among the doctors. Franny rushed into surgery, me chasing after her, fumbling with my scrubs, the anesthesiologist, the lights, a countdown, the incision, the EKG, keeping time, the obstetrician, who seemed to appear from out of nowhere, rummaging around inside Franny's womb, blood everywhere. And then, as if by magic, there he was, my little man, just like that, the doctor holding him up like a trophy. Here you go, Dad. Take a picture. I took a picture. And here I should interrupt and let you guys know that uh, the son in the book and my son in real life was born with some disabilities, with cerebral palsy and epilepsy and just a host of health issues. I forgot to mention that. Oscar didn't cry right away, the prevailing memory. And he was fairly limp in the doctor's hands, eyes closed. A surge of panic in my chest as I noticed this, but didn't say anything. There wasn't time. I snapped the photo, then followed as Oscar was whisked across the room to a little table in the corner where a team of doctors suctioned some fluid out of his lungs. And then came the cries, and I could breathe. Nothing to worry about, one of the nurses assured me. Fluid in the lungs is common with cesareans. The Dalai Lama, I later reminded myself, was silent when he was born. I had read that somewhere once. He's just like the Dalai Lama. And that really was the extent of it insofar as the hospital drama was concerned. No other indications of trouble. According to the obstetrician, we had had a perfectly healthy baby boy. Franny had done beautifully in surgery. 
all stitched up and making progress, and Oscar was checking out fine. No red flags. Vitals were good. Apgar scores weren't elite, but were within the normal range. He had emerged from the womb intact. After five miscarriages and all of the attendant heartache, we had, we had our second child. We had brought him into the world, as parents do, in an irrational act of love. The global ecosystem was in peril, and America, still recovering from the Great Recession, had seen its better days. My fledgling career as a television writer had just been derailed, and money would soon be a problem, as money often was. But even so, here we were, blissful and exhausted in the maternity ward, obedient to our biology, having made the decision to live inside our hopes instead of our fears, telling ourselves that somehow we would find a way. And here I should say something else. Uh, the Other People podcast factors into this book. The, the Brad, who is the narrator, also happens to be the host of the Other People podcast. So go figure. I once had a great conversation with the author Lynn Tillman for the Other People podcast, one of my favorite guests of all time, a New Yorker by way of Long Island, wide open, warm, the kind of person with whom you can discuss just about anything within five minutes of meeting her. After the interview wrapped, we sat around talking off the record. I didn't want her to leave. She asked about my kids and seemed genuinely interested. I told her about Alice, my anxious eldest, fixated on death already. A teacher at her elementary school had recently told the story of Cesar Chavez, and somehow it had been communicated that Chavez had died in his sleep. Now, Alice was terrified that she too would die in her sleep. We had been having trouble getting her to bed at night. The poor child, afraid to close her eyes. And almost certainly, I theorized, some of this anxious temperament had to be tied to Oscar's condition, trying to process her little brother's malady. I could only speculate what it was doing to her. Deeper empathy, hopefully. Heightened awareness of fragility. The painful understanding that a body could be broken. It can be hard, I said, coming to grips with their vulnerabilities. And then this world that we're sending them into, the insanity of it all. I can't help but wonder sometimes about the wisdom of procreation. Have I made a horribly misguided decision here? Do I owe these little people an apology? There was some laughter the dark kind. Lynn, quoting one of her favorite philosophers, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. We talked about lying, the odd necessity of it, a certain strain anyway. The implicit dishonesties in any deep human relationship. Lying when you propose to your partner and tell her that the future will be rosy. Lying when you conceive a child telling yourselves that everything will turn out just fine. And maybe, hopefully, for a certain period, it will be fine. But eventually, of course, as the years pile up, it gets grim. And again, I'm not even sure if choice has all that much to do with it. We do what we do, the basic fact of our programming. Most of us wired to copy ourselves, perpetuating the cycles of existence. The old Samuel Beckett line about women giving birth astride a grave, animals doing our animal business, a certain element of folly to it, a crushing kind of hopefulness too. Bringing new life into the world at this particular moment in history. What beautiful fools we are. Babies born against a backdrop of escalating self-destruction. The miserable crime of climate change is their inheritance. The world and its many charades. Most everyone going through the motions, still pretending that carbon-fueled capitalism is somehow sustainable. Everyone caught in the riptide of it. Unclear on how to escape. An economic model that operates according to the logic of a cancer cell. What we need is massive contraction, and what the system demands is endless growth. 
at some point, a tension that will resolve itself. We'll either change our ways radically and soon, or the planet, it seems, will do away with us. At times, I can find myself resigned to it. A weary shrug. The Anthropocene devolving into an era of clarifying awfulness. Humanity forced into the evolutionary crucible. The Earth's immune system set into motion, calling the human population down to a more tolerable number. Sorry, kids. At best, a few million of us left behind on a mostly barren planet, windswept and scorched, the prophecies of Burning Man made manifest, a kind of primordial desert tableau, buzzards, bartering, bacchanals, a return to tribal society. Or maybe we'll escape, I tell myself. Maybe space travel is the answer, though it can be hard to see exactly how. Whenever I try to think about the impossible enormity of the universe, what strikes me most is how pretty much all of it is designed to murder us. <laughs> Mars, the leading candidate for colonization with zero surface water or plant life, and equatorial temperatures averaging about 100 degrees below zero in summer, not exactly Arcadia. And yet, on some level, I can understand the urge to go there. To look up into the heavens and not see a human future feels like a gross failure of the imagination, a kind of pitiful surrender. Better, I tell myself as a general rule, to move in the direction of awe. There's an asteroid called Apophis, I tell Franny. It's named after the Egyptian god of death. I was reading about it in National Geographic. It's gonna buzz past the earth in 2029 and if it gets close enough and moves through something called the keyhole, then we're guaranteed a direct hit in 2036. Perfect, she says. The entire west coast of North America will be obliterated, I say. But only if it goes through the keyhole. If it misses the keyhole, we're fine. Keep me posted, she says. And how better, really, to respond to this kind of information? The absorption of dire news about which nothing can be done. It's one of the defining characteristics of the modern age. At a certain point, it begins to feel like scenery. Stories of dread and destruction rolling in like waves. A white noise backdrop against which everyday life unfolds. To be in love with the world is, in the end, to be in a state of sadness over it. One and the same. Bad news encroaching from every direction. Good news on occasion as well. Human beings caught in the crossfire, most of us in flight from ourselves, numb from all the forecasts, clutching at our smartphones, armed with our limited knowledge. Dancing anyway, fucking anyway, plotting and planning anyway, flowers blooming anyway, beautiful sunsets anyway. An assortment of possible futures none of which is all that appealing. To avoid the worst, the experts tell us, we'll have to summon the best of ourselves. No pressure. Despair is a proportionate response, but to indulge in it would be immoral. The mess that we're in is unmistakable, and every single bit of it is a miracle. The irrepressible churn of life amid the slow motion collapse. Selah. Relationships consummated, babies wailing, parents shouldering the responsibilities of parenthood with all of its joys and terrors and labors and deep rewards, the endless logistics and constant improvisations, the growing acidity of the oceans, glacial ice in rapid retreat. To be responsible for a human life in this kind of hothouse insanity, to bring a person into this world without even consulting her first, Welcome to the accident, kid. At times, it can leave me feeling like I weigh a thousand pounds. And yet, for all my devotion to cold-eyed realism and hard prognostication, I can still find myself susceptible to sentimental moods, the melancholic longing for permanence, a heightened sensitivity to the speed of it all. Looking to the past, astonished by how much of my life is already gone, just a handful of childhood memories left, bits and pieces, 
the college years, an absolute blur, early adulthood, a vapor. It goes. And now here I am, lost in the thick of middle age, my children still young, the planet going to absolute shit. And I know for a fact that I'll never see it clearly enough, no matter how hard I try. The very heart of my life, the golden age, the best of it, wholly despite the darkness. And I'm missing it because I can't help but miss it. Because this is what human beings do. We miss things, even the best of things. We miss it and then we miss it. It's in front of us and we can't see it. And then we lose it and there it is. So all I could imagine as I was reading this is like, okay, this is kind of depressing. And some of you in the audience know each other. So I'm imagining you just texting each other <laughs> being like, I want to cut myself, but uh, that's just, you know, that's a section where I felt like there is a, uh, like a window into the heart of the book. And I wanted you to have an opportunity to see that. I'm also going by what happened the other night at my book launch, where I read a section that I thought was like funnier. And then I read a section involving my family and the section involving my family played better. So I'm just going by my test audience. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great excerpt um, and it had a different, you know, I've read it before, um, but it had a different resonance hearing you read it somehow, just the way that you read is really great. And I realized like that section in particular has everything, it has Beckett, birth, Wetzel's pretzels, you know, <laughs> stuff of life. And I feel like it is a good representation of your book because it very fluidly goes from very serious existential dilemmas to the mundane and banal and every day. And that's something that I think probably adds to the feeling you were saying where you said that people say that it reads like a memoir. You know, it has that, <laughs> it has that quality to it because uh, you know, that's life, I think. And that's what comes through in a lot of your prose and kind of in the way that you arrange it, I think too, of, you know, um, these kind of vignettes um, marked by an asterisk in between sections and we're kind of free to go different places. So that's something just, I really enjoy. Well, I'm just, yeah, I think, I think that uh, the book deals in trauma, at least in part, and there was a lot of failure uh, along the way. As you know, I think I've probably talked to you about this ad nauseum, but I just, I wrote multiple versions of this book that I detail in the book itself. This eventually became a book that was, or that is about its own making. So the theme of creation applies to art as well as family. You know, it's a, it's kind of a broad application and where I landed, and I want to make sure that, uh, that I'm careful to say that this is just me speaking personally, but where I landed is that I needed to be brief. <laughs> um, that really is where it wound up precisely because I, I, I'm petrified of boring people. I don't want to bore people. And I feel like it's maybe in particular with a book like this, that's dealing in uh, difficult stuff. There's no need to go on and on, like try to compress it. Don't leave things out. You know, you don't want to skimp over. I think that I always say this with the Steve Allman line, like you have to slow down where it hurts for the reader. And I definitely tried to do that. And it was definitely difficult, but I also really revere compression in literature and I didn't want any wasted motion. So that was sort of what I was going for. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the epigraphs where you get the title is, um, the Charles Simic quote says short poem, be brief and tell us everything. Um, I was curious if you're prone to writing in short bursts uh, in early drafts or if brevity is only something that can be achieved for you in later drafts. Like even if you're drawn to this uh, brevity, is that something that you have to kind of carve out in your writing or is that something that, you know, that's how your thoughts arrange themselves when you're uh, writing from your life? I think that's where I get to in like, like the later and later drafts get more and more compressed and maybe vignette -y. I cut a lot. Uh, but I always, you know, I say this often on the podcast that there are writers, I think, who are truly gifted in the sense that they have a very attuned sense of their audience. They have a sense of the reader as they're drafting and as they're writing that far exceeds mine. I feel like in early drafts for me, I'm, I'm too, I'm too self-obsessed 
I'm too, I'm sort of trying to sort things out on my own and figure out how to do it and trying to please myself. And I just lose track of the reader at the end of it. And mm -hmm. it, it's like a hard one thing for me to get to a place where like for, with a book like this, you could easily be really honest and really detailed and you could render it authentically, but basically you're just sharing your pain. <laughs> you know, there's a difference between doing that and rendering it in a way that's palatable to readers and useful to readers and engaging to readers at the level of narrative. And it took me a while to get there. I also conceive of the job of a writer. And again, I got to make sure to say that I'm speaking only for myself here. I'm not trying to make a broad rule because that's annoying, but I conceive of the work of a writer to compress. Like, isn't that, that's how I think of it. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to make each line as powerful as possible. We're supposed to say as much as we can in as few words as possible. And if that adds up to 700 pages, then wonderful. You've probably written a great 700 page book, but I don't know if I have a 700 page book in me. We'll see. I kind of feel like anything I have to say, if I can't say it in 250 pages or so, maybe I'm not done, but who knows? Maybe I'll surprise myself. So I don't know. I really respond to it. And, you know, I really respond to work that feels like that has no wasted motion. And that could be a short book that's working in a kind of vignette mode, or it could be like a really lyrical 400 page novel or memoir or something. It just, it just depends, but I'm always trying to make sure that I've done the work and I'm not like putting it onto the reader. Like, Oh, you figure it out. I, you know, I've said it, I've done as much as I can here. I don't want to ever yeah. feel like I skimped. Yeah. And in your search to find the right form for this book, um, did you ever envision, you know, a really long door stopper kind of novel that you could, you know, that you could accomplish in this way? Or did you always envision it as, you know, something at least similar to this form that it is in now where it's, um, you know, this, this idea of this being brief, but also saying everything it's like the, you know, achieving the impossible, but also the necessary thing of a book like this, you know? I learned through failure that it needed to be shorter. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Like there's an iteration of this book that I talk about in the novel in Be Brief called uh, Happiness is Chemical. And it's about this like really down on his luck high school chemistry teacher who has a fling with one of his colleagues. And she's actually like, you know, she has problems with alcohol and they have this kind of like messy hookup that ends with him dumping a bucket of water on her because he wets her bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then her ex-boyfriend, who's like a problematic, abusive, like drunk of his own, like winds up finding out about it. And it just becomes this like big, huge mess and everything goes wrong for this guy. And then his dog dies. I mean, it's just like one thing after another. And I was trying to be funny, but I remember, and I, you know, you, you can read about it. Like my agent was just like, you know, I need some oxygen. <laughs> I, need, I need to feel like something's going to get better for this guy, I think is what she says. <laughs> and then there's another iteration that I don't think I necessarily, I don't think I go into in the book, but I wrote an, a, a version of this book where I'm talking about miscarriages and I go into all five of them, all five. You can imagine what it must be like to read a book like that, like just a nightmare, you know? And yet I, I tried to sell it. Like I took it out to publishers, you know? And I don't think it was badly written, but I think the the feedback that we got was like, wow, this is really well written, but like, I, I'm so depressed or just this, I don't, it was just, there was no humor in it. And it just, I think took the air out of people. And mm -hmm. it's because I was too focused maybe on authenticity and not, and not focused enough on the reader. This is what I meant by like, it took me a while to get to where I was like, oh, I'm talking to somebody. There's going to be somebody on the other end of this thing. And so in Be Brief, I only deal it with one miscarriage. I compress that down and you really only need one. You don't need five, you don't need five of these to get the point, you know? And for some reason, it took me a failure to figure that out. Yeah. And you mentioned authenticity being a goal, of course, um, for writing, but also, you know, maybe the real authenticity for you is being, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, of um, this idea of like writing as persona or writing as, you know, actually depicting what you're like as a person, <laughs> you know, like you are someone that, uh, you know, thinks both about existential philosophy things and makes jokes, uh, you know, along the way, like in your podcast, I think we can see that. And um, I think this book accomplishes that. And so I think 
you know, that tendency to condense or to think of the reader in mind is maybe also a way to approach um, you being like more, it's just maybe the book is more you. That's what I'm, you know, just kind of thinking about. Yeah, I think that I, you know, I've, I've said this a bit, but I think that I don't want to be cool on the page. I feel yeah. like I see a lot of that in literature where the narrator is like really cool and like really, really smart just always has the right line, you know, and some of that's <laughs> well, good. Editing can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of that's good. I think I gravitate to that sometimes. Sometimes you want to be in the hands maybe of a cool narrator who's cooler than you are, but a lot of the times that leaves me feeling alienated. And I'm like, this isn't how life is. This is not how I know life to be anyway. Like I'm not cool and I'm not together and I'm confused and I'm trying to be straightforward about that on the page. Uh, but I also have found, you know, that amid the difficulties of life, the sadnesses and tragedies and failures and whatever, you, you know, what have you, that it's also beautiful. It's often funny while it's being tragic. You know, these things don't happen in a singular fashion. They often happen simultaneously and it's a big mess. And, uh, and it's interesting to me at that level. So I try to render my fiction in a way that reflects life as I know it in that sense. And then you know, for me, I think that I have dealt with a lot of sadness and loss in the last decade in particular of my life, but really it's been there as a kind of consistent theme uh, since I was a teenager. There's been a lot of, I've just borne witness to a lot of tragedy and felt a lot of tragedy. And, you know, a lot of us are like this. And humor for me is a reflex. Uh, there has to be jokes, you know, I'm just trying to make it through, you know, and I, I think that on a daily basis, you know, as a parent of a disabled child, like you better have a sense of humor. You better. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you can function without it. So, you know, it's my coping strategy is basically the point. And it's just something I also really respond to as a reader. Like I love books that are sad, funny. Yeah, definitely. Um, your podcast, Other People, is up to almost 800 episodes and has been operating since 2011. I'm curious if there were certain interviews in particular or writers. Um, you mentioned Lynn Tillman in the book. You mentioned a few other people in the book. But I'm just curious if there are certain interviews or like nuggets of information or, you know, parts of the interviews that gave you some guidance or encouragement, like for writing this book in particular, where you're in the middle of your job, you know, like your podcast. And then you think, oh, wait, that, that actually just opened up a whole new avenue for me as a writer. Did you ever have that moment? Yeah, I think so. It's hard to pinpoint though, because I think of these conversations, which happened like from my end of things, it's all happening very fast because I've got to read through the book and prep and talk to the person and then produce the episode and put the episode up and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's sort of like that scene in I Love Lucy where they're eating the chocolate. Um, <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, and so I think of the interviews in the aggregate sense more than I do in terms of like specifics. And I always say that like the lessons that I've learned most powerfully are really simple, but worth repeating, which is that the writers on the show that I've interviewed who seem to have the most success, who seem to be the most prolific and who seem to be the happiest in the work are the ones who write every day more or less or on a very regular disciplined uh, calendar they read a ton and they just love reading it's effortless for them to read and they consider it part of the job i think they work at reading and making time to read and they read widely and deeply and uh, you know inspired me in that way and then the third thing is that they don't do it for money or at least not in a serious like i'm gonna get rich kind of way like yeah. Or even or even like make a living, which is partly sad, but also I think just like somebody being real, you know, in terms of what the odds are in this world that we live in for somebody writing literary fiction or nonfiction or poetry to break out. I mean, that's a very small table. There are no there are only so many seats there. And so I think those people psychologically are able to sit down and do the work without all the baggage that so many of us have where they're, you know, we're thinking about, okay how's this going to do? You know, is this going to be the one? And I, I totally get that. I've done that. I think every writer does some of that, but the ones that I've met who seem to be the steadiest are doing it in a primary sense for much different reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you talk in the, um, you write in the beginning of the book that it took, this book took 12 years to write. 
Um, and, you know, as a listener of your podcast, I remember moments throughout the past years of, you know, you mentioning on your podcast monologues or even in interviews that, you know, you're frustrated with the book or you've changed your mind about certain things about the book. You, you're kind of open about the process of writing it with your audience. I was wondering, you know, looking back on that, having a finished product now, a finished book, um, do you, did like, did you, along the way, did you see, did you sometimes feel inclined to be more private or think like, maybe I should not talk about this as much? Or do you feel like that accountability was helpful? You know, having an audience that is kind of along for the ride with you in some regard of um, knowing the book is in motion and kind of, you know, when I was listening, I just had this feeling of like, you know, you're one of us, <laughs> you know, of like the writers that listen to your podcast. I think it's a cool thing to hear a podcast host talk about their struggles with the book as well. So I'm just kind of curious about that process of like writing and also being kind of public about the process along the way. So the first thing I'll say goes back to the beginning of your question, which is that, you know, in the book, I say it took me 12 years to write. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently and I was like, I really don't know how long this book took me to write. <laughs> For me to actually pinpoint it, I would have to like go back and dig yeah. through my, my Microsoft Word archives. Like there are pieces of this book that I wrote a long time ago. I mean, that's kind of how I was really mining like thousands and thousands of pages of mostly discarded stuff. And every once in a while I would pull something out and put it down and then add stuff to it or subtract. And um, so I don't know. It took me a long time though. It took me a long time and a lot of, you know, a lot of failed versions. Uh, and then as far as like sharing, you know, I think with a book like this, I, I do want, I need to, I feel like I'm going to soapbox here, but I feel like podcasting <laughs> and autofiction are regularly uh, bashed lately, or I see it and maybe I notice it because I do both, but like, is it, am I just picking things? I used to blog too. It's like a trifecta, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but it's like, I, I, uh, I really like podcasting. There's a reason why people listen to so many of them. It's a cool medium. I think the barrier to entry is low maybe. So it's not as elite. And so people like to Maybe there's a lot of bad ones or something, or I don't know what it is, but uh, likewise with autofiction, maybe people feel like it's not as much work or something, or it's just not as interesting. And I think that's less an of an expression of some rule of how literature should be and more just an expression of personal taste. And I bristle a little bit when they get confused. And so just for me personally, I love autofiction. I also love non-autofiction, but with this project, for me, what I was trying to do was look at things squarely or as squarely as I could, especially when they were really hard and really sad and really painful and really confusing and to sit still in it, even though my impulse was to get up and do something else and like turn on sports center, you know, or whatever it is that I do to like numb out. And, you know, I wanted to go through that and try to put it down and eventually get to a place where I was putting it down in a way that was communicative rather than just expressive, like communicative and reflective rather than just like recollected. I just said this with Steve Allman. He said it perfectly, but you know, just to get to a place where I was really uh, aware of the other person at the end of the line. And I just know as a reader that when I read books like that, they feel really medicinal to me. I love that. It's a, you know, it's got an ameliorative effect and I feel less lonely and I don't know. It's just like, oh, so somebody's being real with me or I could, you know, someone's just talking to me here. Like that is a relief to me. And then I think I also, and maybe I, I, I don't know how much the pandemic affected the writing of this book, but it seems like it probably had some psychological impact, you know, because the last draft of this was birth in quarantine. Like I had a lucky situation. We had uh, like a, a live in, my son's aide from school lived with us. So we had some help in ways that I think a lot of parents didn't. And it was only because if she didn't live with us, we couldn't, she couldn't continue to work because she would be going in and out. So I had some time and the pandemic also foreclosed upon social obligations, which was a joy to me. It was like, great. <laughs> you know, like I can't, you know, there weren't, there weren't as many things to do as many errands to run or places to be or requests or things we thought we might have to go to, you know, how there's like emotional pressure with that stuff. And yeah. I just had like a bubble where I was like, okay, let me focus. And then I think one of the directives that I gave myself when I was writing this was that I wanted to try to write it as if I were already dead or if I was like really just knew I was going to die soon. And I know that sounds melodramatic, but it was useful to me. Like, what would I say 
if yeah. I was if I was like writing from the beyond or I was about to check out what's important to me what am I you know what, what do I really have to say here and it's also kind of a sense of like I don't know if I'll ever get another book out of me since this one was like you know the like such an ordeal uh, I hope that's not true but I was like well let's just pretend like this is it you know uh, and then I think it's just a desire to take whatever that I've, whatever I've been through and to try to make, make it useful to myself as a learning experience, but also to the reader, you know, there's an alchemy in that for me. Yeah. And may, maybe people, there are other readers who just don't see it, or they just see it as like, a, I don't know, like a cry for help or something, but that's not what it is to me. Like, I think at its best, when somebody's writing confessionally, they're ventilating stuff for readers who might be suffocating. And maybe if you're not suffocating and you read it, you're like, ew, like I can totally understand how somebody could read this and just be like, dude, this guy's, this guy needs to get it together. <laughs> I had, I had a friend of mine, you know, I was like a friend of mine read it and I was like, Hey, and it was the first time I talked to him since he got it. And he's like, read your book. He's like, it's good. It's depressing. You know? <laughs> I was like, all right. And then we just like carried on with the conversation. So, you know, I get it. Um, and I understand that the book, you know, all books are this way. They're only for specific readers in specific ways, but that was what I was going for, you know? Yeah. I never want to read narrators that are put together personally. So I, I guess I mean, that's, that's something about me, but I, 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 the first time I ever felt this, but like, I probably didn't articulate it to myself was when I read Catcher in the Rye as yeah, a, yeah. as like a teenager okay. in Indiana. And there's this kid from Pensy Prep who like knows everything and lives in Manhattan. I'm like, like he's like can find his way around a city. And, you know, I felt so alienated by it. I was like, I liked it, but I was also like, what? This doesn't seem like a kid. This guy seems like he's 30, you know? And uh, I haven't read it in a while. Maybe I'd change my tune if I looked back on it. But I just mm -hmm. remember feeling like I, I couldn't connect like on a, in a one for one way. So I don't. If anything, I want my reader to feel superior to me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong when you have yeah. that attitude. No, um, I'm willing to sacrifice my, uh, you know, whatever uh, illusions I have, delusions of grandeur. <laughs> um, we have 15 more minutes. I have a few more questions, but if people want to start um, just typing them into the chat, it looks like that's the best way to do that for this particular Zoom. So if you want to just put your question in the chat, I will read them to Brad. So I'll moderate that, but put your questions in there as soon as you want. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, but while we're waiting for that, Brad, I had a question about something you had told me um, when we spoke uh, a couple of days ago about your Los Angeles book launch, that um, your daughter asked a question during the Q&A portion of your event, um, expressing the desire to hear the part of the book that was written about her. Um, and I'm just, that makes me, that made me really curious about what your experience was like writing about your family, um, you know, in a novel form or memoir form, you know, I know this book took on many forms, but you know, it's like, she knew that that part was about her. Um, <laughs> what's it, what's it like writing about your family and your children? Um, is that a complicated process knowing that they'll read it someday or even, you know, at the reading, <laughs> you know, she's like asking to hear about it. I just think that's a really interesting perspective that you must have in the kind of writing that you do. So first of all, like when it comes to, to classifying it as a novel, just real quick, I don't keep a diary. I don't have a good memory. And I couldn't render the book in a way that I felt was, would be satisfying for a reader unless I moved some stuff around and fictionalized some stuff and gave myself that creative license. But a lot of the time I was working pretty close to the bone, you know, and so that's why it's a novel, but it really is a novel, you know, and uh, I hope I hope that clarifies it. And then as far as writing about family goes, it's nerve wracking a little bit. Uh, but I, I couldn't let that stop me because that was what I needed to write about. And again, that sounds melodramatic, but with the stuff that we've been through, like I tr just trust me, I tried to write about other stuff <laughs> like for years. You know, I tried so hard, but, it, you know, at, at a certain point, you just surrender to what you have to deal with. And so I think, again, it comes back to um, looking at things through the lens of mortality. And I don't know, like I, I, no one is on the hook in this book more than I am by, yeah. an, by exponents. It's not like I sat there and like dissected my daughter or something in the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's me I'm dissecting. It's my yeah. inner life that I'm really, you know, putting um, under the microscope. 
so you do the best you can. I have a very lovely family and uh, trusting. <laughs> and I think too, like, you know, we're all going to be dead in a blink. And I don't mean to sound really morbid, but like, who am I fooling? Like, it's not that it's just a book. It's no, it's going to be dust. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm not coming. I'm not trying to be exploitative. And I'm not trying to be mean. If I were doing that, then there would be a problem. Uh, I think my intentions here were sincere and earnest. And I don't know, I just, it didn't trouble me too much. But the last thing I'll say is that, you know, while I don't keep a diary, I did. Uh, and this is something I'm really glad that I did. I kept like a notes folder in my phone where I would write down funny things that my kids said when they were little, because if you don't do that, you forget. Yeah. And some of these things wound up in the book and they're That's better than, they're better than anything I could make up. Like the stuff yeah. that come, like <laughs> authentically comes out of a kid's mouth is better than anything that I could conjure. So it, that, that did come in handy and it was kind of fun in a way. My daughter, I feel like has some of the best lines in the book, like funniest lines and perceptive lines. And so it's kind of fun to give her like a cameo in that way. Yeah. Um, Nate Chase in the chat is asking, Brad, why does your writing and comedic ramblings always remind me of Don DeLillo? <laughs> well, Don, Don and I are very close and he has been a huge uh, mentor to me. I'm totally kidding. I don't know Don DeLillo, but I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did anybody believe me <laughs> i don't know if anybody believed me i tried to keep a straight face but <laughs> least I I, she, she believed oh she did okay good yeah. no i i'll say this i'll say this i'm a huge fan of don delillo even though he's not very funny uh i think at a, a sentence level like i really loved underworld what are some other books of his that i read i read uh libra i'm forgetting but i really was impressed with underworld especially those like that baseball sequence at the beginning you know so I kind of revere him. Oh, and White Noise. White Noise, I think, is a funny book, actually. That's kind of satirical. So he's got that in him, too. But he's just a super smart dude. And um, I don't know. So maybe maybe Don DeLillo has found, like, you know, he's found his way into my wiring somehow. <laughs> um, Rachel Krantz asks, uh, says, I love this book. Can you talk about how you took those fragments and made it into something page turning for the reader how did you think about structure you know how did you create that momentum with the vignettes and fragment fragments that you have the short answer is i don't quite know the long answer or the longer answer is that i have lived with this material for so long that when i got to the last draft it was very intuitive and very exciting uh, it's the most enjoyable writing experience of my life the writing of this book because I knew that it was coming together in a way that I could feel solid about. And I knew I wouldn't have to write it again. I didn't know if it was going to find a publisher, but I knew I wouldn't have to write it again. And I'd never felt that way before. And so maybe the answer is, you know, if you just fail enough times and you live with this material for a long enough amount of time, eventually you just sort of figure it out and jigsaw it together. But I think, I don't know, maybe I was just thinking a lot about the reader and really had like that attuned sense of like, okay, don't bore them. Don't just sit here and kvetch, you know, like this is a story, it's got to move. And how do you like to be treated when you're a reader? And like those kinds of like, like in a, like with like a kindergarten teacher's tone, you know, like that's kind of what I was trying to do. I wanted to make sure that there wasn't wasted motion, that the thing was moving, that I was slowing down where it hurt, that I wasn't giving myself outs. You know, I wasn't letting myself wiggle out of things or make jokes where there shouldn't be one. You know, there's some places where you just have to sort of look squarely. And then intuiting how it should end, intuiting the direction that I was going and how the pieces fit together. Like I'm kind of, I mean, I want to sound absurd, but like, I'm kind of like amazed by it. I'm like, oh my God, like it did come together because it doesn't feel traditionally structured, but I feel a sense of unity in it, which was part of the, the fun. I was like, oh, you know, that's what you're going for. You want it to feel whole. Yeah. And it was just really intuitive. It wasn't Maybe there was like a little note, you know, a piece of paper or a notes file on my computer where I was like jotting down ideas, like for what was going to come next. But it, there was no like blueprint or outline that I can recall that was in any way like predictive. It, it just sort of came to me day by day. Yeah. Um, Joseph Grantham asks, a lot of this novel to me is about failure and boredom with oneself. How did you get past being bored with yourself or tired of yourself to write this not at all boring novel? Great question. Yeah. I often feel bored with myself. I think 
that's a concern, you know, like, what does anybody want to hear from me or my silly life, you know, which is privileged in so many ways, you know, but still has its agonies, just like anybody, you know, and so it's easy to think like, what do I, you know, and I'm just, I'm bored with it. Uh, but I think this is the hard work. You know, if you excavate this stuff, and if you slow down with it and give it your full attention in a sincere way, and you don't give yourself outs, which can include sort of like making fun of yourself, taking it apart. This is stupid. What am I doing here? Oh my God, I'm so full. You know, all that kind of like mental chatter that you can get into that narrative, like that passes and then you're looking at the thing and you're sitting still. I think eventually maybe I got to a place where it became interesting to me, authentically interesting and dangerous. You know, like, oh, wow, I'm really actually scared to talk about this. Like, why is that? You know, or yeah. this was uh, profoundly confusing. I have no idea what's going to, well, I don't even know where I am. You know, like, that's interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and then ventilating it with jokes every once in a while when, you know, you got to, I need a little bit of that. So I think too, as writers, especially writers who are working in long form, it's just baked into the cake. You're going to become bored with your project and with yourself as you go through the process of drafting and writing it. It's part of it, just as failure is a big part of it. And I think this is my new theory is I think the writers who are like really good at this and prolific and they win all the awards and everybody claps and everything like I'm guessing that these people are maybe better at the mental discipline part of it and the physical discipline of getting in the chair every day and reading every day but they're also good at failing and they totally, or not totally, but maybe more easily accept the failure that is part of being a writer, the getting bored with oneself, the yeah. writing 500 pages of a manuscript that you thought was going to work. And then you realize it doesn't the, you know, all that failure, you know? And uh, so I think that's what, when it comes to being bored, you can't let that stop you. <laughs> if you're bored yeah. with yourself, just keep going. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we should wrap up, but um, thank you everyone for your questions. I was going to end, I had a question about this quote, but maybe I'll just read it really quickly is one of my favorite parts of the book is um, you write, what I know in the end is how very little I know. And that's it. The only correct posture is one of bewilderment. Um, my question, which might be too big for this last couple of minutes, is like, is the only correct posture in writing that, you know, one of bewilderment? And it's something that I just think says a lot about your book of, you know, looking at life and uh, all the things that it contains and just being bewildered and trying to describe that. So I don't know if um, you have any other last thoughts on that, but that's something that I felt like really just uh, it's one of those parts of the book that just feel like the heart of the book to me. Yeah, I think so too. I had a, a friend of mine recently uh, lost a family member, you know, it's like grieving and going through a tough time. And I texted this person and said something, you know, how you, you're trying to come up with something to say, you know, you're trying to, something like that happens to somebody, you know, and so you're nowadays you're sending a text and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm so sorry. You say, I'm so sorry for your loss or whatever you say. And then I was like, you know, and this person's kind of a hippie. And I was like, you know, just like try to keep your cosmic vision. <laughs> And then I sent it and after it, I was like, oh God, like, does that, you know, is that something to say to a grieving person? Um, but what I meant, <laughs> what I meant was, is that, you know, when you're dealing with a trauma or a difficulty or a challenge in life or a drama at work or falling out with a family member, whatever it is, it, the, things narrow, they get really small and you become sort of obsessive and like narrowed in your thinking, you start to take everything really seriously. And when I talk about bewilderment, I'm not talking necessarily about like being in like a blinking confusion all the time. I'm talking about like trying to remember to have like a cosmic vision and some humility. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know what I am or where I am. And if I look up into the sky, especially at night, it's a, it, especially when I'm not in Los Angeles because you can't see any stars here. <laughs> but you know, not to sound like too hippie, but like that's that's a relief to me. That resets me, you know. So I. Yes, I do want to try as much as I can to be bewildered in that sense, just to have like a sense of perspective, I think is what it comes down to. Not, yeah. to, be not to be paralyzed, you know, it's not that you don't try to find things out. It's just that maybe you 
have some humility before like the grandness of the mystery. And so I kind of want that vibe in anything that I do. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap up. So thank you, Brad. Listy. Thank you. Thank thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chelsea, for uh, being such a, a lovely host. And uh, is it interlocutor? Is that the word? Is that um, the word? I don't know. I prefer the term moderator. No, moderator. Yes. No, moderator. <laughs> I could have totally <laughs> misused that word, but you're a great moderator. Thank you um, to Powerhouse. Thank you to everybody who showed up and asked questions and made time yeah. in their day to hear me ramble. So I really appreciate great. it. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Chris and Powerhouse. Thanks. Uh, just a few quick notes. Thank you much, so much to Chelsea Brad, everyone who tuned in and asked questions. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, please buy a book if you haven't already. Uh, and then if you're in LA, I'll also be hosting an in-person event for Brad on May 16th at Stories Books. And then he'll be back at on June 6th, June 6th at Stories for the NDA Auto Fiction Reading Series. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.